cut it up or you focus in on a detail and really try and understand it. Well, I started out in, I guess, first of all, the Gay Lib Street Theatre in London in 1969, and a mixed media street theatre group called the Exploding Galaxy, which is basically a, a free flowing anarchic poets, artists, dancers, painters, sculptors, musicians, all riding on the crest of the psychedelic wave in London and uh, exploring. The, instead of thinking of anything having boundaries up till then really, everything had its frame. Art was in frames, music was in just on records, and it usually lasted three minutes, a song. Everything was very formularized, and so we were exploring the destruction of edges, if you like, the blurring of all the edges. And naturally that very quickly went into the blurring of the edges of life and art and creativity. And then it got into the blurring of personality and identity and gender, obviously. So we were basically uh, erasing all the programming that we felt we'd inherited. Conservative and conformist programming. And just thinking, how do we break it? Is there really an end to anything? Where can we go? How much further can we go? How much more can we expand and improvise? but not just with skills, but with everything, food, clothing, hair, anything and everything was raw material. Basically, we made the world raw material. Remember, boy, We'd been doing lots of performance art, mainly in the street as a coom in the north of England. And then we moved down to London. A friend of mine in London said there's a big basement in this old factory that's come up empty. If you want to rent it, you can come take it over. So we just put everything in a big three-ton truck, drove down to London, and moved into this derelict basement in a factory. And I'd already started feeling that, that we needed to bring music back in more. We'd got a lot into the body performance and ritual and so on, but it, it, it seemed to me that we should try and incorporate all the different senses. So we began to make tapes first, loop tapes and, and environmental tapes. And then, because we had no money, we started to build our own speaker cabinets and our own amplifiers. And while I was working with uh, Cozy doing that, the caretaker said, oh my, my son has a friend who builds synthesizers and electronic gadgets, which was Chris Carter. And so we said, oh, tell him to come over and we'll take him for dinner and tell him what we're trying to do. So he just came over because of uh, a friend mentioning him, walked in and we said, we're trying to completely rewrite what music is in terms of popular music. We want to be like Stockhausen and the Velvet Underground simultaneously and just level the playing field. <laughs> we want to take out rock and roll and see what's left. Do something that makes sense to people who grew up in the, in the 50s and 60s in England when the industrial society was crumbling and the economy was crumbling. Something that was just about us, the classic thing. And um, Sleazy had been coming to see Coombe do performances, and his big interest was William Burroughs' tape recorder cut-ups and so on. And so he said, I'd like to do tapes. And it was really that casual. Um, I didn't want to do vocals, but the others were even more adamant. And they said, you're the one who always talks, so I ended up with the vocals. Somebody had left an old bass guitar that was broken, and Chris rebuilt it, and that became my instrument. And Cozy bought the cheapest possible lead guitar at Woolworths, a satellite guitar that was 15 pounds. And then she said it was too heavy, so we sawed all the excess wood off it. And it looked just like what would later be called a Chapman stick. We just kept the strings and the, the pickup. 
because we weren't looking at it as musicians, and I just said, why does it need extra wood? And got the old jigsaw, and, went, and it just developed that way, very uh, organically. The main thing being no one, no one knew how to play any instruments, not even tune them. And one of the first things that we said was that we can't have a drummer, because drummers always impose rock and roll stereotypes on the music. We can't have anyone who plays guitar, because guitarists always want to show off. That's why Cozy got the guitar. And basically, we all took the thing that we were least able to play to prevent ourselves doing cliches. And then we just would meet three, four days a week and make noises and sounds. And when we liked one, we would tape it with a cassette tape deck. And anything that we liked, we'd try and recreate, see if we could make a higher ratio of sounds that we enjoyed or found exciting by editing the tapes. So that's what we did. We just used to edit the tapes at the beginning of the week, listen to our favorite bits, and then emulate that until eventually we could, we could make the sound we liked all the time. And I don't necessarily want you to agree with me, but you want to know why I'm like this. These are the reasons. And that, to me, is a much more valid dialogue with the public than the one that says, I'll tell them what I really think later. When we first began doing Coom, it was very much a reaction against television and privilege and art being something that the middle class, the upper class, were privy to, but the working class weren't. That it was, and that you needed to be taught, that you needed to be given the right language to comprehend it, that you had to use expensive materials. Kuhn was very much about found personalities and found objects. Everything was from the street and thrift stores. And one of the ideas of that was to challenge the status quo in the art world and prove that you'd ha you could make relevant and important art with none of the usual qualifications. That you could destroy all the preconceptions of the right way to do it and still make something fantastic. And what happened eventually was that Coombe started to be sponsored by the Arts Council of Great Britain and the British Council. We got sent to Milan and we would be given cocktail parties in the British Embassy as the rising young performance artists in Britain. We go with Gilbert and George and people like that. And at that point, we had to stop and terminate the whole project because we'd proved our point, which was that somebody with no official traditional art training had made important art. Therefore, that was the message. Anyone else could pick up that and carry on and do it themselves and go in the various ways they wanted to go. But for us, we made our point. So our next task was to look at the music industry, something else we weren't qualified for, and see if we could do something interesting with that. And that was how Throbbing Gristle grew from Coombe, was in conversations. You know, here's, a, he's, here's an even bigger enemy that's more all-pervasive. What can we do here? to mess with their heads. And around the time that we were crossing over and we'd already begun doing Throbbing Gristle at the Death Factory in the basement, although we hadn't gone public with it, we were offered a retrospective at the ICA, this big government-sponsored art gallery in London, which is on the Mall. And the Mall is the road that leads to the gates of Buckingham Palace. And in fact, all the buildings along there are owned by the Queen and the Royal Estate. So the ICA is considered to be very prestigious, and it was the, the ultimate place to do modern, contemporary, cutting-edge art. So by having a retrospective there, we were being told we'd been accepted. And in a sense, they'd learned, or they were ready to absorb us and commodify us, and have us as the pet radicals. So it was our job to antagonize again because that we weren't interested in being absorbed and accepted. We wanted to be a perpetual thorn in the side, a virus that was always picking away and mutating 
so that new things happened, whatever they were, even for the sake of it. So we decided that all art ultimately is prostitution, that basically almost all work is prostitution. You sell skills for money. So we called the show Prostitution as a, a satirical commentary on the art world and that we'd even been sucked into it. And at the opening night, we decided instead of red wine and art critics that we'd do something that was much more uh, proletariat, more working class. We wanted to, again, take the archetypes and, and warp them, distort them. So we had big kegs of beer instead of wine. And we got uh, a northern comedian who told pornographic jokes. And we made a cabaret, basically. We had a striptease dancer who did a striptease. Throbbing Gristle played live for the first time in a big, a big venue. We also had the band that became Generation X, but we called them LSD because <laughs> punk was also taking off parallel to all this. In London, punk was also growing too, and we were actually all friends. And it was only a matter of style that was different in terms of the music. And we were trying to, we were more paramilitary and anti fashion. And although it pretended to be anti fashion, punk was actually all about fashion too. So there were a few little differences, but the, the bottom line was mischief, energy, uh, anger at the establishment and hypocrisy despising bigotry and to be the bull in the china shop stir it all up and and create a dialogue and create some chaos and say you know you're asleep this is wrong what's there's, there's things to talk about the world isn't perfect england is not the wonderful kind place that it pretends to be and uh, so they play and on the opening night, we got a special security company that we knew that were all transvestites, and they were all over six foot tall. So all the security for that night were these six foot plus transvestites. And then we sent invites out, and this was part of my mischief. I sent invites to all the papers in Fleet Street with no explanation, it just said prostitution on one side and then that there was an art opening, but they did come. And it was this massive event where there were hundreds of people and a lot of people like Seizing the Benches, a lot of the punk people came to. Vivian Westwood had an exhibition of clothes in the corridors outside. And for the very first time, the mass media in England saw punk and industrial and 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 uh, industrial music punk music gay behavior in public just all these styles and these movements and these underground ebbs and flows all appeared vis visibly for the first time in one place on one night and it just as the hell's angels would say it blew the citizens minds it just went crazy, the newspapers went crazy. There were questions in Parliament where they said, these people are the wreckers of civilization. Um, the Queen sent three law lords down to the gallery after the uh, opening night. And the law lords are representatives of the Crown Estates and the Royal Family and their job is to deal with all the legal matters and try and diplomatically find solutions. So they basically said, we want you to close the show down. You can't have this show within a few hundred yards of Buckingham Palace in one of the Queen's buildings. It's, it's a scandal. You know, and you've got exhibits of strange performance art with naked people and tampon boxes, boxes with sculptures made out of used tampons. And uh, we just refused to close the show down. And to his credit, this man called Ted Little, who ran the place at the time, said that he would, with us, we would 
take it over, squat the building to keep the exhibition open. So they went away and we never heard from them again because obviously they didn't want to have an even more public confrontation. And we managed to keep open for the full time of the show. And this was all six, eight weeks before the Sex Pistols went on the television. We did a live broadcast from the exhibition on a Friday night at six o'clock, which is the most watched moment on English television, six, six o'clock on Friday night. And they gave us from six till 6.30 to debate the pros and cons of the exhibition which I thought was a wonderful end to the art career. We actually got the entire British population talking about what is art and when does life and art mean the same thing and is that okay and can we have sex in art? And uh, you would see daily papers and they'd have editorials and it would say things like, is this Dada? You know, I just thought it was so fantastic to get daily papers discussing Dada and surrealism and performance art, usually in a very um, visceral and sensational way. But it was out there suddenly. And more importantly, all of a sudden, all this activity that had been just growing and growing and growing just exploded into the mass media. And once the Sex Pistols went on a few weeks later on the same program, that was it. England was changed forever. And so was music. So that, that was a very, very important moment, even for global culture, because it launched on a huge tide of outrage and sensational press coverage. Just the front pages of the newspapers for days and days and days. It launched the entire first wave of, of the destruction of the old culture. Well, we, we, had, we, we clubbed together all the money we had, and we had just enough money to press 790 records, I think it was, 789, something like that. So that's how many we ordered. We just said, here's the, how much money we have. Could you press as many LPs as it, it pays for? And I actually thought we'd take three years to sell them because it was, uh, it was a very different sound then. It seems odd to think of it, but it was just completely alien. And I, I was actually hanging out at the time with Mark uh, Perry, Mark P from Sniffing Glue, the English punk fanzine that started. So I gave him a copy. And he gave it to his friend, Sandy Robertson from Scotland, who worked for Sounds, one of the music papers. And Sandy really, really liked it because his favorite piece of music in the world was um, European Son of Delmore Schwartz on the first Velvet's album, the long instrumental Freak Out on side two. And so he wrote a review of it and gave it five stars, you know, the maximum said it was you know, the most important album that came out that year and all, all this other stuff. And then John Savage, who worked for the NME, said, can I get one of those? Because he read Sandy's review and he reviewed it and gave it five stars. And all of a sudden we got a phone call from Virgin Records saying, you know, your album's getting all these rave reviews, can we buy some? Yeah, I guess. How many do you want? They said, oh, we want 500 this week. And so we sold out in a week. We kept about 200 back for mail orders, and, and that was it. So we had to repress immediately. And since that date, which was in 76, no, it came out in 1977. We recorded it in 75 and 76, but it came out in 77. It's never been deleted, ever. It's always been available somewhere in the world ever since. And we recorded all of it on a, a cassette, uh, a Sony cassette recorder, a portable one with a condenser microphone. And we would just put it on the table in our basement where we played, 
Or we put it on the stage when we played live. And then when we had enough pieces we liked, we made the album. And the only reason we used that cassette deck was because I, I, I asked William Burroughs what tape recorder he thought was the best one, and he recommended this particular Sony tape deck. So he had a hand in it in a way too. Breaking identity and not believing that anything had to be the same from moment to moment. I, I, there's something about that that I think sums up what I was always hoping would happen, which is that ideas are far more powerful than technology or artifice or commerce. You know? That if you really are fortunate and have the courage to believe your own fantasy, your own dream, you can make the most amazing things happen. Cut it up. Or you focus in on a detail and really try and understand it. I was walking across the park in Hackney with my friend Monty Cazaza, saying, we need to call this music something. It's got to have a name. And uh, so I talked to Monty as we went, it's about a 10 minute walk. And I, I said, I thought about calling it Factory Records because of Warhol, but that's too obvious. And he said, well, you've already named it. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, you keep using the word industrial when you're describing it, that you want to make records like a factory makes cars. You want people to think of it as an industry that's not necessarily friendly, that it's just that music has become an industry that just supplies what people want instead of being creative anymore. And so I said, you're right, let's call it industrial music. And that's how it happened. Up until, and that was September the 3rd, 1975. And it, it, Why is that date so relevant to you? Well, because it's, it's, um, <laughs> it was the anniversary of the outbreak of the Second World War. So, and one of our, the first sticker that I ever made to put up just said on it, nothing short of a total war. And I used to stick them up all over London and on the subways and so on with no explanation. So, in fact, those stickers we actually, on the very first pressing of Second Annual Report, the first record we made, we actually put one of those stickers on by hand on each one in the back. We couldn't afford to print covers, so we Xeroxed the sleeve notes on a sticker and stuck them on the back one at a time. There's something about that that I think sums up what I was always hoping would happen, which is that ideas are far more powerful than technology or artifice or commerce, you know? That if you really are fortunate and have the courage to believe your own fantasy, your own dream, you can make the most amazing things happen. And those are the four sculptures that got them saying, these people are the wreckers of civilization. What is that experience? It's not as if it's the kind of music that you can memorize and hum, necessarily, although I've heard some people do. It's something else, it's a feeling, you know, that classic thing. It's a feeling and it's an intention and there must be some purity in the expression of it that allows other people to embrace it so totally. That it's not yours anymore. It happened to be, it happened to come into existence with your participation, but it's not owned by you. And I think that's one of the things that Brian Geisen used to say that I didn't understand for a long time used to have a little permutation poem and he would just say poets don't own words words poets don't own don't poets own words words poets own don't don't poets words own poets don't own words and you go round and round like that I think one of the unfortunate things that happened with industrial music, although it wasn't necessarily 
foreseeable was the the moment when it became associated with and, and married to dance music or dance rhythms and whilst at the beginning it was very exciting to have very contentious, sensational and unusual lyrical content dealing with previously unthinkable topics in terms of popular music have that if you like, uh, seduce people into, with, with the dance beat, seduce people into hearing things they might not otherwise want to hear, which goes with my idea of there's the logo, dance, and here's the information. The, the tactic was a great tactic. There, there should have been no problem. It wasn't, it was um, hard to have predicted how quickly wanting to please by dance superseded having content. And, and one of my real um, complaints about contemporary culture over the last 10, 15 years is the lack of content and the, the degrading of content to the point that conversation does not occur anymore between the audience and the artist. There is nothing being said. And I think that's, that began for industrial music around the time of the Belgian New Beat and, and unintentionally with the Chicago Wax Tracks axis of music. And it became very popular and it drew a lot of extra people into the family, into, into that, that particular cultural tribe. But it also, if you like, made it just a little too easy. And it's one of those unfortunate facts with culture that the more that the lowest common denominator is pleased, the less impact is usually occurring on changing society and changing the way things are. Breaking identity and not believing that anything had to be the same from moment to moment. The British Parliament and the British system of law has been going on for over a thousand years. Probably the oldest surviving pseudo-democracy. And so it's a very rigid class system, a very rigid social system. The education system is all geared to filling the needs of society. At that time I grew up going to school, you took an examination at 11 and depending on your score, you went to the school to teach you to be in a factory, the school to teach you to be an office worker, or the school to teach you to be an executive. And then if you did very well, you got a scholarship to the public schools, which are actually the private ones, and there you were trained to be a leader of men. They literally used to say that. You are here to learn to be leaders of men. Well, I was one of the fortunate unfortunates that got a scholarship to one of the public schools. So I was jumped from upper working class to aristocracy. Cut it up. Painful but fabulous. I think it's one of the most important pieces of art that I've been involved in making for a long time. I think of it as being, in book form, the equivalent to the prostitution show at the ICA. What I'm hoping to have happen is it's a jigsaw. And in that way, it already relates. It's a jigsaw about a person whose original name was Neil Megson, who in 1965, consciously chose to build an artist 
a mixed media artist who was called Genesis Fioridge. And so at the beginning, the artist was Neil. And Neil created Genesis as an icon for how he believed art and life could be. That in fact, what's, what had been forgotten was that art and creativity is, if you like, the psychic hygiene of the species. The payback, I hope, for everyone else is that they'll see the book and they'll go, wow, that looks like fun. You know, a bit weird sometimes, but wow, it looks like fun. I would have liked to have lived like that. And the answer is, you can. Not the same, but using the same structures, using the same techniques. You can build your person who lives the fantastic life. <laughs>